So this Blender tutorial is a bit special because I've been told personally from my mom that I talk too loud, and when I get excited, I also talk too loud. So we got to keep a calm with this tutorial. We wouldn't, wouldn't want to get happy or excited, right? That would uh, ruin the mood. Well, uh, the reason I need to be so quiet is I'm at my mom's house and my sister's asleep, and um, she's got a big uh, thing she has to do today, and I feel for her. So we can't be waking her up. Um, either way, uh, as you've been seeing uh, or playing in the background is this footage um, and the goal of this tutorial, what, why are we here, why are we gathered here today, it's to take this footage and track it. Now tracking is something I've done like a dozen times, but I think it's one of those muscles that you got to flex, it's a use it or lose it. Uh, we need to keep uh, doing tracking tutorials every once in a while just to freshen up our skills and uh, so that I can actually do shots. And yes, we're going to do a VFX shot with this in an upcoming tutorial. Um, it's good to show how the cookie's made instead of just showing you cookies because I feel like a lot of the times people are like, how did you track it? And, you know, this is a tutorial for that. Either way, uh, I'm in Blender 3.2 Alpha. Um, I would get 3.3, but I don't have it downloaded on this uh, laptop. So, you know, I don't, I don't see that as a big sacrifice. Either way, here's how we track. So I'm gonna do this as kind of like a first uh, beginner, you know, first time tracking, and also maybe a bit of you've seen the concepts before and stuff like that. So if I skip anything, please excuse me. So first thing is in the movie clip editor, we need to import in our footage. Why? Uh, because if we don't have footage, what are we going to track, you know? Um, here we go. So I filmed footage exclusively for you guys. Look at that. And it, this isn't necessarily the simplest shot. It's nice and handheld. We're not going to have any motion blur issues and all this. But, you know, there there's details that exist at the end of the shot that aren't there in the beginning. So... Before we begin, a couple formalities in the render tab. I'm going to go to color management, and I know this because I filmed it, but you might not. This looks very, like, washed out. Uh, I didn't film it this way. It's actually the view transform set that to standard. And you can see, oh, the contrast is back. Balance has been restored to the universe. Well, before we uh, continue, uh, you probably noticed once we get out of the frame range, boop footage is gone. It's only 176 frames, as you can see, at 30 frames per second, and we need to respect those things. Otherwise, it won't respect us. So, set scene frames is automatically going to make our project endpoint the last frame, 176. Prefetch is just going to load all of this into memory, which it is, you can see by this uh, purple. Some people might argue it's not purple, <laughs> but uh, the purple line. It's loaded into memory, so we don't have to lag uh, to play it. And finally, in the output tab, I'm going to set my frame rate to 29.97, because that's the frame rate I filmed with. If you have 60, set it to 60. Okay. So our goal is to get a track here. And to do that, we're going to need to put down a bunch of 2D trackers. Now, we could use an automated approach, but I think what might work better is some uh, manual tracking. So the idea is we want to get our 2D trackers dispersed throughout our shot, like in 2D space, some of them on the left, some of them on the right. Am I talking too loud? My mom says I'm not talking too loud. She gives the thumbs up. She also says don't add her input into the narration, but here we are. She says I can even talk louder, but I'm not going to test that. Uh, either way, uh, we have a bunch of 2D trackers that we want to disperse throughout the shot. Um, and we want to pick areas that are high contrast, that are visible throughout the whole thing. So I'm thinking, let's put a tracker right here. So I'm going to control click. And you can see this isn't tracked yet, but you can see that area kind of exists throughout the whole shot. So that's why I'm picking it. So I'm placing a tracker here, alt S for the search area, just make sure where it's looking for this pattern is big enough, or the search area is big enough that it's going to be contained in here. So at no point is the thing going to be here, and then the next frame it's going to be outside of it. Just pick something like that. And I guess before we add that tracker, let's enable normalization, which is just going to get rid of any lighting variation changes. It's not going to care about that. So let's see if this tracks. Uh, for tracking, you just use these buttons, or I use Alt-Right-Click to track forwards frame by frame. Okay, 
So it seemed to do pretty good. And then the track just kind of stopped. Um, this isn't me stopping it. It literally like lost it. And I think what it's doing is it's looking for this pattern. But once we get to this frame, it's sufficiently different enough that it doesn't match it anymore because it changes over time. So maybe something else we can do is in the uh, matching where it's saying, I'm looking for this pattern again and again and again. Instead of matching it on the keyframe, which is the first frame, uh, let's have it match previous frame. So either in this uh, sense, uh, with previous frame, what it's going to do is it's going to track. And for each frame, it's going to look at the one before it instead of looking always back to frame number one. And this should have it stay on there. By the way, L to uh, lock the tracker on the view. And yeah, that seems to be working a lot better. By the way, control T to track all the way forwards, control L to lock. So that is a successful tracker. What makes it a successful tracker? Well, it kind of stays on target the entire time, although it does get a bit blurry at the end and a little hard to tell. But I think it's staying on target roughly. A bit of uh, shifting is expected. Uh, let's try to do that again. So let's try this high contrast area. It's not only good for Blender, but it's good for me because I'll be able to tell exactly where it is. It's uh, perceivable to the eye. Control T to track forwards. Let's review the tracker. Doesn't need to be the best one in the world, just needs to be sufficiently. I mean, it definitely drifts a little, but it's not horrible. Let's do some other features far in the distance. So not only do we want to distribute our trackers in 2D space, so like we have some up here, some down here, but we also want them distributed in terms of depth, some of them in the foreground, some of them way off in the background. To do that, maybe let's uh, track one of these light posts just to get a far off tracker. And that, that's kind of an easy one because it's, uh, you know, there's just sky in the background. But that seems to be pretty good. And while we're at it, let's get a super in the background track to maximize that parallax. Okay. So I'm pretty happy with this, and you might be asking why add any more trackers. Uh, it's because Blender relies on at least eight trackers throughout the whole shot. If there aren't eight trackers, it's not going to be able to get a solve. Uh, so we need to add in a couple more trackers. Now, what I'm seeing is, I don't know if it's bird poop. I mean, do birds poop? I think they poop white. But this is black. This is like expired bird poop. You don't want to eat this. You, you want to make sure you eat it before the expiration date. But th this is a good feature. The only issue is it kind of comes out of the shot. But it's there for most of the time, so I'm going to include it. I'm going to put this down right here. And instead of tracking forwards, we now track backwards. Shift, Control, T is the shortcut. And it's going to track until it comes out of frame, which is perfectly fine. And we can do that a couple times uh, with other bird poop. Look, maybe it's like dried gum. I don't know. That one's for the philosophers. They're going to do thought experiments and be like, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, OK, let's get a couple more trackers. Let's do something a bit fancy. So I'm seeing this uh, thing on the ground that can't be as easily described as like, you know, track this pattern because there's a bit of perspective shift in all this. So instead of a location tracker, Anything I do here is going to affect newly added trackers. It's not going to go back and retroactively destroy these ones. Um, by the way, we should probably save. I'm going to call this overly long tracking explanation. Explanation. Um, we want to change this to something that actually captures the perspective. Now, you could use perspective for this. It might be the obvious choice. But affine is almost the same thing. There, there's a bit of a nuance there, uh, which I'm not going to describe right now. But affine almost does the same thing. It has, you know, location, rotation, scale, and shearing that it's going to look for. Not necessarily perspective, which almost does the same thing, but it's significantly faster. So if I add this tracker here, it should latch onto it. So let's see, control T. Yeah, you can see from our 2D window right here that it's uh, holding on proper. And we could do that for a couple uh, spots on the uh, ground. So we could do one here. 
Let's track forwards. Perfect. So you can see the tracker is actually shearing a bit. It's, uh, you know, the you, you see what shearing is. It starts off as a square. It ends off as a diamond or a rhombus, as we call it. But um, at this point, we have one, two, three, four, five, six trackers throughout the whole shot. And then we get two more. So yes, we can solve at the very end, but we need more trackers in the beginning. So let's, um, I'm going to add a couple more trackers, both at the end and the beginning, completely ignoring what I just said, <laughs> which isn't a bad thing. You got to be able to, you know, have fun. So I'm going to track backwards here. Perfect. So I think we have, I mean, you know, we want them distributed in 2D space. They seem to all be contained here. So it would be good to get some trackers here, or some here. So we could do that. I mean, I think very simply, this one's a good feature. But kind of no matter what we do, they're going to not live that long. So let's add one or two more. I'm going to use another affine for the sign, because that's like something that has a lot of detail, and we can tell the perspective warp. So this should be pretty good. So we have a lot of good trackers. Uh, we just got to make sure there's at least eight in the beginning. And ideally, they last throughout the whole shot. That would be even better. So I'm just reviewing my shot here. And I'm seeing some uh, clear winners here. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? A tracker for the car. Add a tracker here and track it far. Yeah, I mean, this is a good one. It's throughout the whole shot. It has some of that depth change I'm talking about. And let's see, now we have uh, seven. Not bad. I'm, I'm eyeing up this license plate here. Uh, it does kind of come out of the shot at the very end there. Hmm. And maybe an obvious one to try. It might be a bit of a difficult track. It might not work. Is here. It's a very high contrast area, but the background is changing, so I might not like that. Let's try it. No, I definitely did not like that, as expected. Uh, maybe we could try maybe a foreground element here, just like a good patch of, well, to us, it kind of looks indecipherable. It's like, oh, what is this? Uh, to Blender, it's going to perfectly latch on to this, I'd imagine. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, see if we have enough trackers for a solve already. Uh, we should. But Blender might say that some of these are bad. Um, not in the... Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, so let's go for a solve. Um, is this shot a tripod shot? No, I'm actually moving it. It's, it's a phone shot. I'm moving through space, so it's not on a tripod. Keyframe, I'm going to enable. What does this mean? Well, it's a bit complicated, but what it... What it <laughs> I just say it's a bit complicated and never explain it. Um, you see that there's this keyframe A and B that get disabled when I click this. What this does is it picks A and B for us. But what, what are A and B? What's it picking? What, what am I talking about? When you get a solve for the camera, it's not going to like look at everything. It's going to take a small window, maybe frames 70 to 90 or 40 to 55. It's going to take a small A to B window. It's going to construct a solve and then extrapolate that. So instead of like trying to get this general solution, it's going to find a local one and then say, assuming this is true, uh, what has to happen before and after. Okay. Um, and there is a science to picking A and B, but we'll have it pick for us. Let's see if this works. Okay. So it, it definitely did not work, <laughs> um, at least for the frames that it's trying. We can tell because the solve error is NAN, non, doesn't work, pixels. We want this number to be an actual number in between like one and, you know, or between zero and like one would be ideal. So let's try going for our own keyframes. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. One through 30. Okay, now we actually get a number, which is impressive. Um, again, there's a science to picking these and we can try out a couple ourselves. So let's do 62 to 100. And basically, we want this number to be as small as possible. So if it's giving us 163, that's no good. We want this to be as small as possible. So 1 through 30 seem to work pretty well. I, generally, the science to picking these keyframe numbers is you want to um, pick 
numbers such that the, uh, the trackers that exist between, in this case, frames 1 and 30, uh, you want them to have a lot of parallax shift. What does that mean? Well, the trackers exist between frames 1 and 30, but they're like relationship to each other, like the, this distance, this distance, uh, they change a bit, which happens when there's perspective change. So I'm moving away, away from those trackers, so there's bound to be some. I'm just going to try one more option before we call it quits. Let's try 120 to 150. And it also gave us 1.4, so it didn't seem to matter. Now, to get this number lower, there's a couple tricks that we have. Uh, the first one is once we're good on keyframe A and B, you want to click this, um, not that one, you want to pick a focal length. Uh, because the more information we have about the camera, how zoomed in we are, in other words, the focal length. Right now it's assuming 24 millimeters, and I can tell you it's not because my phone doesn't shoot 24 millimeter. Um, the more information it has, the more it can accurately predict our camera. So right now it's going to say, assuming these are fixed, it's going to try out a bunch of focal lengths and tell us which one's the best, which one most accurately represents how zoomed in we were. And hopefully this number goes down. So let's try that. And look at that. Immediately we went from 1.4 to 0.34. And if you haven't solved before, you're like, okay, you know, that's a decrease. But as a veteran of tracking, this is a very good number. Like if you get under one, it's workable. If you get under 0.5, it's a good track. And we could even go a bit further here. And I, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't think we need to. We don't need to do an advanced tracking tutorial here. Uh, but just for those who care, what you want to do is you want to show the info. That's going to tell you the average tracker error. So 0.34 is the error, the average of all these 0.53 pixel error, 0.59. You pick the one that's the worst. So 0.2 is a very good one. 0.53 is kind of bad because it's above 0.34. You take the worst of these, like this one. And then what you say is bring down its weight. In other words, how important it is. It's kind of like we're firing or like the opposite of a promotion. You know, this uh, one didn't perform well at work. We're decreasing its weight, its value in the company. And then... We solve again and you can see now we're at 0.3 and you can kind of do this song and dance all day of decreasing weights and there's add-ons that do this uh, but for now i want to get my 3d camera in the scene so now that we've solved our, solved our camera let's set up tracking scene and you can see now the camera is moving back the same way we did it's not going to look really correct like it kind of looks like this plane's hovering and not connected on the floor uh, but it's something the reason it's hovering, by the way, is if we enable motion tracking, you can see these are these dots, these empties are these trackers, right? You can see as I select them, there's different ones being selected here. Let me do that again. Now that you know to look for it, I want to be fair. Um, and these trackers in particular, these ones I'm selecting are on the ground. But um, the plane, which is supposed to be on the ground, is nowhere near these. So what am I saying? I'm saying if this plane was on the ground, it would be on these empties, but it's not, which is why it looks like it's hovering. So if I was to, like, very roughly kind of, like, position this here, doing not that clean of a job, but it's better, you can see now the plane kind of looks like it's attached to the ground a bit more, unlike the cube. Again, not that accurate. How do we get it accurate? Well, we can just select three of these trackers that are on the ground and hit floor. This is going to say these three trackers must be on the ground because I defined them as floor and it's going to move the camera accordingly. Another thing we can do is the camera is awfully close. I'm just going to select these two trackers and say, let's say there's a meter in between them, set scale. Well, that brings them even closer. So let's say there's two meters in between them or three meters, which means the camera must have been further away. Uh, you can adjust it like this. Now, realistically, between this and this, there was probably, I'd say a meter and a half. So right now we're using meters, so that's how I know it's a meter and a half. So I think that's pretty good. And the, and the, the, the reason this point's so big is it's like a two by two meter thing. Um, but let's see. Yeah, now this looks like it's much more attached to the floor. I think it'd be easier to tell if we make this smaller. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select my camera. 
which by the way we can still move and it's going to do that whole thing but i'm going to have this uh, set from the cr i'm going to have this uh, rotate based on the 3d cursor on the z axis i'm just lining this up somewhere a bit more convenient and i'm lining up this x axis so it goes all the way down in fact let's make it so the y axis goes all the way down something like that yeah that looks super nice and we can also do a bit of a shift so we can move the uh, center point this is just a orientation of our scene. It has nothing to do with our solve. So I'm just doing that. Let's rotate it so the x-axis is flush uh, with the thing. And that's pretty good. You can see this 3D cursor is pretty locked on. In fact, let's move it so it's right on this line. Yeah, you can see that's very locked on. And at this point, I don't think we need this anymore. Uh, we could kind of reconstruct our scene, basically. Um, n nothing too complicated. You know, it's kind of funny that they call, like, basic, the coding, like, visual basic, they call it basic, but uh, it's, it's not that simple. But maybe compared to, like, C or C sharp or one of these, you know, it must be. So I'm just going to... Now, when whenever we add geometry, what you have to notice is now it's actually tracked onto the scene, right? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a very simple modeling of our scene. Nothing crazy. So I'm making the ground. And this kind of tells us our orientation is a bit wonky. Or maybe the actual place is a bit wonky. I don't know. It looks like the actual place is a bit wonky. And we can't forget there's probably a bit of lens distortion as we go further out. Again, doesn't need to be perfect. So we do something like this. We model our curb a little. I really just want it to be accurate in this area, since this is where we're going to be adding our CG. Um, and you can see this is tracking on very well. And you could kind of go crazy here. You could be like, okay, add a loop cut, like, all the way over. Wow, this is taking forever. Let's move this over here. You could say, oh, there's a loop cut over here and a loop cut over here. And then the reason I'm doing that is so you could like model this like pillar. You can go crazy with it. I'm not gonna. So that is uh, your prerogative, as uh, people like to say. Okay. So I think I'm pretty happy with the solve. Again, anything we add to the scene, and I'll give you a bit of a hint about what, what we're adding. It's going to be a floating. Let's change this back to median point. It's going to be a floating thing. So you can see, wow, this torus really does look like it's floating correctly. It's going to be a floating thing. And the reason I'm doing the ground is we want to have these shadows catch on the floor, uh, which we're going to talk about once we get there. But I think uh, this is a pretty good uh, track, and I'm happy with this. So we'll uh, leave it there. As always, at the end of these uh, tutorials, that was an abrupt transition. Uh, as always, at the end of these tutorials, I like to pimp the ever-living picture frame. Let's go with that uh, out of my Patreon. So, what is Patreon? Why should you join all this? Uh, Patreon, link in the description, is a place where you can take your membership of this channel, if you think about it that way, or maybe your donation to this channel, uh, to the next level. When you become a patron, like the 700 to 800 people that are currently patrons of this uh, channel and CG Matter and Default Cube, if you don't know, I have two channels, uh, what happens is you get three things in return on top of actually directly contributing to what I do. So if you like what I do, you know, Patreon's the way to go, because uh, ad revenue is unreliable, to be honest. But um. You get three things in return. It's not just a donation. Uh, you get early access to tutorials. So you could have seen this a day or two early, which is cool, but it's kind of like, are people really kind of like waiting at the edge of their seats for the new Blender release? Maybe the new Blender tutorial release. Kind of like it. It's kind of like uh, when Lost would come out every Friday or whenever it came out, you know. Um, there, There's that. Uh, there's also the blend file, so this one's, in this case, this is big, so you can download 
uh, the blend file, including the footage, the track, you don't need to do it yourself. And once we add this uh, CG element, which I'll describe what it is pretty soon in the next tutorial, um, you don't need to track your own shot, you can just add it right in. So you could get blend and project files and anything I've uploaded over the last three years. You can also get for just five bucks, you get hundreds of project files that you can play around with. And thirdly, you get exclusive tutorials. I try to make one or two a month. Uh, these are tutorials that are not available for free on YouTube, but this one is. So um, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you learned something. For those of you who are active or are going to become active patrons, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching and that's it.